All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, so uh, let's pick up from the last one, uh, the multi-site churches. Now, when you look about the multi-site churches, uh, it's one church with many locations in the city. Now, that's what, something that we have, right? We have north, south, east, west, and central. Again, it, uh, the best part about this is people can access the place easily. In a city like Bangalore, we don't want to travel 15 kilometers to get to church or 20 kilometers. If you get something close by, you'll go there. So it gives an opportunity for uh, access, gives an opportunity for many people to serve as volunteers, uh, provides a way for the congregation to engage in missions. So from these multi-site churches, people can go out and start new churches from there. right? Uh, and then it provides a source of shared resources, shared learning. So now when you look at APC, for example, right, we have five locations in Bangalore, five locations, but we're all one. And we intentionally think of it this way. You get what I'm saying, right? Now you all go to North, right? APC North Church. I go to APC East Church. Now is it, it's not like, okay, you go to APC North, I'm going to APC East. No, we are one. Right? So I can go if I want. And many times when I'm not rostered, I go and I've gone to West, APC West and set. I can go, I go to Central and set. There are many times I've gone to South, right? So it's not like we are not different churches. We are one church with multi sites, right? And the best part is we all learn together, we all grow together. So especially now, what we do is we have the same sermon being preached everywhere, right? So all of us are growing the same spiritual maturity. Now, I may meet somebody, uh, for example, I'm, I want to start a life group, a family life group. So I may call up somebody from APC South, South Bangalore. I hardly know anybody there. But I call up and say, hey, uh, so we are looking for a life group leader. Do you think you're... Uh, do you think you would be interested? Do you want to think about it? Do you want to pray about it? Right now, I know that this person has been part of church for maybe what three, five years, ten years, whatever, and I know that he knows how APC is functioning. Right, I know that okay, he's he has heard the sermon on Sunday, right, and it's not some different sermon. What, right, uh, Bible prophecy uh, uh, is last week uh, a Sunday sermon. End times and Bible prophecy. So, okay, I know that that's what we are learning as a church. So we're all growing together. And that's also another reason why in our life groups, we have about 43 life groups right now. All our life groups, we have also zeroed down by saying that all life groups, the discussion will be about Sunday sermon. So not everyone are discussing whatever they feel like. They're discussing the Sunday sermon. Right, so this provides an opportunity to be more structured, to grow together, and be stronger. Uh, right, uh, be stronger together as a church. Um, now, uh, let's quickly go into reformation in church structure. Let's read Luke chapter five, verse thirty-seven and thirty-eight. The Lord Jesus about new wineskins. Right, let's read that. Luke chapter 5, 37 and 38. Yes. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Right. Very practically, Jesus is speaking here. No one puts old wine in a new wineskin. Sorry, what is that? No one puts new wine in an old wine skin, but new wine must be put in new wine skin so that both are preserved. Now, the way God did, uh, the way ministry is done in 2000, in the year, okay, so let's say 1990s, and the way ministry is done in 2000s, and now we're in 2020s, it's all different, right? The way the ministry is done has changed over time, right? Gone are those days when people would, uh, you know, not, especially now, you have the time to go out the whole day, stand and give out tracks. Those days are gone. And things are changing. So we see three kinds of major restorations that happened in the church. Martin Luther, 
the reformation of theology in the early 1400s uh this changed the knowledge of god so meaning when martin luther he he had the uh, 95 theses put it was a time when people did not have the word of god they did not understand god's word right they they were doing a lot of works expecting god to uh, for you know to bless them and expecting god to uh, you know forgive their sins by doing works martin luther came and said hey salvation is found through grace and faith in jesus christ and he began to come up with the theology the real theology of god's word he began to preach it he began to teach it and people started to change their thinking started to change hey how do I receive Jesus? It's through faith in Jesus Christ. God gives me the grace to do all the gifts, to, to you know, flow in the gifts that God has given me. And so I must use it in the church. It's not like I should just come and go. Right? We're all partakers of Christ. Or, and then there's this whole understanding about the Lord's table. How to take the Lord's table. Uh, the whole understanding about uh, the Pauline apostles, uh, epistles. Right? Uh, so things changed. He changed a lot of things in terms of knowledge because remember during the dark ages people had no idea right as i was sharing in the break um if you during those times during the dark ages if you had asked somebody hum, where is jesus from they may not have even known that why no bible they just know jesus jesus died on the cross or you ask them like theory theology you ask them where did jesus die they won't know how many disciples Jesus had? Some of them may just know if they were listening to the sermons. Right? Or uh, oh, where, where, where is the first place that Paul went in his missionary journey? They won't know. They had no idea. But when Martin, uh, Martin Luther came in, he began to expound all of these truths. Right? To understand that, hey, uh, you know, about the cross, about what we are, about our identity in Christ. So knowledge was expanded. That happened in the 1400s. Then, there was reformation of spirituality in the 18th century, meaning the, the, the way we experienced God. So, for example, during the, the early years of, of, of in church history, there was just, you know, you sing a song, sing the hymn, close, sing the hymn, close. I'm not saying that that was not good, but that's how it was, the structure was there. But during the 18th century, a little later on, things started to change, especially when you look at worship. The worship ministry people started to bring in the new kind of uh you know bring in the element of more music adding instruments uh adding guitars because before it was just the organ and a choir but things changed the way they experienced god people began to uh you know depend on uh, began to flow on prophetic worship or getting into new types of worship, new songs a new understanding of wh what worship is or uh, you know the way they experienced god was different it changed does god change no god is the same but the way they experience god is different now there'll come a time when our children or the next generations maybe 10 years or 20 years down the line they may experience god in a different way totally right? it may be like every two people out of five are prophetic in nature maybe god can give them like uh, you know visions and pictures of extreme accuracy this is what like you know for samuel uh, in samuel how samuel prophesied about uh, saul king saul he says you go here you'll find two people they'll give you bread you know in detail prophetically so maybe there'll come a time like that or maybe there'll come a time of in worship where things may just change. We don't know. Uh, but there was a reformation in spirituality. Then there was reformation in structure. And over the last 30 years, we see the local church changing in structure. And things will change. That's why Jesus said, you put new wine in new wineskins. I cannot say, for example, 20 years down the line, if I am still a pastor, by God's grace, if I am still a pastor, I can't say, hey, 2024, we did it like this. That's why we saw miracles, we saw healing. Uh, but the, these young, the next generation, that is 2024. We are in 2044, pastor, things have changed. And I have to 
be able to accept that change. Right now, even now, if you look at it, uh, when you look at ministry, the way we minister to teens and youth has to be different. I can't tell youth, hey, youth, uh, open the Bible and let's read from, uh, uh, you know, Acts and let's do a Bible. Of course, there's a time and place for that. Right. But nowadays, for us to get youth, we need to be able to relate to them. Right. I need to be able to understand what are the things that they are going through. And then the teens we've got. If I have to, as a leader, if I have to relate to them, I need to change. I need to put new wine into new wine skins. And this change is constant. Right? Five years down the line, we don't know whether the fun the the structure of the church is going to be the same at APC. We don't know. This is working for us. Let's continue this way. But we don't know what's going to happen next. When you look at the mainline churches, we don't know. Now we may say, hey, nothing's happening in the mainline churches. But we don't know. God may choose a mainline church to send revival. We don't know. Why God? Why did he choose mainline church? That's his wish. He may choose a Methodist church and say revival is going to start here. And he may get you know, 30,000 people to come to that church. He may choose it that way. But we need to understand that, okay, new wine, new wines can be got to change the way we do ministry also. right? Now, that some things are constant. Just because we change the way we do ministry doesn't mean we change the word also. That doesn't change. Preaching of the word, worship, ministry, all of that remains the same. right? The word does not change. We don't come up with a new Jesus. We don't come up with a new Holy Spirit. All that remains the same. But the way we do ministry, it's new wine. We are the wine skin. So we got to adapt. We got to change. Right? Uh, you know, my son keeps listening to songs and he plays these drums. And he started saying, you know, uh, you know, my dad, you know, when I'm playing those swells, and he started using these words which I've never heard. So, uh, so I asked him, "How did you learn?" Said, no, no, you. If you go to YouTube, you can listen to it. You know, they play it like this, and I was surprised. That he's not. He's nine years old. He's using words which I have never heard of. I've passed 15, 20 years. I'm in the worship team. I've never heard of those words. Right? Uh, but they're using it. I, in the, so things are changing. So I need to adapt to it. And he listens to some worship songs. I don't know. I haven't even heard of these guys. Like some band, worship band. They are a praise and worship band. There's a little like contemporary rock kind of a worship band. I haven't heard of it. But very nice songs. But you, but if you listen to it, it doesn't sound Christian. I was asking him, hey, what are you listening to? He said, this is uh, Christian songs. There, really. <laughs> So I can't say, no, put that off. That's demonic. No, it's it's the generation that he's living in. right? For me, I like the nice, good old integrity music, 1990s hymns. I like it. right? So, But they are ahead. You got to go with them. right? Uh, and, and so we must understand that this change will keep happening, and we must adapt to it. Then we equip the saints, equipping of the saints. Um, we there's reformation in church structure, a new way of doing church. The church develops uh, new strategies, new plans, new ideas uh, on how to equip people. Now we have Bible college. There'll come a time, maybe Bible college will just be multi-site, different languages. We don't know. I may have one headset here, and the languages can translate to ten different languages. Possible? Very much. I'll talk in English. If you are a German, you are listening to it in it's being translated into real time into German. Right? If if you're from France, I'm talking English, it's being translated. You just choose the language, it just translates into French. Ministry is different. Right? So we don't know what can happen, but um, the government and structure of our local church, we as leaders must be open to change. We don't, we're not supposed to be rigid and say, no, this is how we'll do it. Open to change. Open to how God is doing it. right? But in all of this openness, uh, pursuing God's blueprint, that is, again, the blueprint of the churches, I will build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God's blueprint is he wants us to be strong, 
raised up as an army. Uh, and we look at the different facets of a local church, but uh, growth, spiritual growth, right? Uh, growth in every area of our life, growing in the gifts of the spirit, growing in wisdom and all of these things. That's the blueprint, right? In all of these additional things, the new wineskin, we must not forget, right? Uh, what is happening, like what God is doing. Example, recently uh, an elderly person came and asked, is, told me, you know what, I don't like the worship nowadays because of all those <coughs> lights and the LED screen and all of it. So I was listening to him and he kept saying the same thing, you know, and you know, too loud, there's too much of drums. And now I understood where he's coming from because he's maybe in his. Uh, about 70 odd years old, and I completely understand, right? He must have grown up with hymns, and uh, and I said, yes, uncle. Nowadays, you know, youth prefer that. And uh, but how? What about us as uh, you know, senior citizens and all? This? So I remember telling him, see, I, I I remember sharing this with him. I said, see, we need to adapt ourselves. I, and the example I gave him was, when you were growing up, did you have a phone? He said, no. Did you use Google when you were growing up? So did you use YouTube? Did you watch anything on YouTube? No. Did you travel by airplane every now and then? He said, no. Things changed. You got a phone. You're using the phone. You can go to Google. You watch your YouTube videos. You read the news from that. Do you subscribe to newspaper? He said, no. Why? He said, I, I've got the BBC app. I read everything on the app. That's good. I said, why did you change? Why didn't you still use the newspaper? Why don't you still you know, have the videotapes you know, and this VCR? Things changed. So I said, see, the same way in ministry, things have changed. There's nothing wrong with having an LED screen. Is it wrong? No. You're just having a better experience. But the moment my mind goes on the LED screen, Rather than worshiping God, I've changed my focus. And I and you know, I've heard this saying, and I'm sure you all have heard it. There is no perfect church. If there is, the moment you're in it, it becomes imperfect. No perfect church. These are things that I always say this. When I used to uh, 2012, 2010, 2011, we never had all of this. If you see our videos, we had like big speakers and some five, six uh, monitors there, and uh, we were never like this. So over time, new wine, new wine skin. See, the problem is people see it now. Oh, wow, LED screen and sound system. and You're seeing it now. But we have gone through the phase of nothing. Right? So the same way, we must adapt, change, grow. Right? If we need to be fruitful in ministry, the way ministry is done also changes, but the focus does not change. That remains the same. God is constant. Right? So let's go into the next chapter. Uh, chapter 4, Stages of Growth and Development. Now, I'm going to go a little quick because uh, we need to cover quite a lot. So I'm not going into the... Uh, case study of Jeru the Jerusalem church and the Antioch church. We know it, right? Uh, just a brief overview. The church was planted. 3,000 people were added. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people, again, were added into the church. The church started growing. Uh, uh, church started growing. There was a good balance between the gifts of the Spirit and teaching of the Word. The, uh, the prophetic ministry grew. The Jerusalem church raised up elders sent people to different places to plant many churches. Um, and so the base, the primary church was Jerusalem. Then we have the Antioch church, where again, there was many supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles, but there was no leader. So the Jerusalem church sent Barnabas. Barnabas went and searched for Paul, brought him in. And uh, the, there were new believers. Uh, they received the prophetic ministry. So it's not like only Apostle Paul and Barnabas were in the prophetic so we have a person named Agabus here from Jerusalem who was mentioned in the book of Acts uh, who gave a prophetic word to the Apostle Paul. But there were many of them who were flowing in the gifts of healing and prophecy and all of that. 
um, leaders who are in fellowship with one another. They involved in missions, uh, and it became an apostolic base for prophets, prophets, uh, and other ministry teams. Right. So you got these two churches: Jerusalem, the mother church or the primary base church. Then you got the Antioch church again, a very powerful church. Even though it was a small, it was smaller compared to the Jerusalem church. They they had prophets, apostles already functioning in the church. Now, as a local church, what are the stages of growth that we will see? Right. So basically, if you are planting a church, what are the stages of growth? It's like you look at it in the natural. Right. When you when you are a child, you go into you know pre KG or whatever you know uh, Montessori, and then you go into first standard, then you go to grade one, grade two, grade three. What happens in each stage? You learn more, and you're exposed to more. There's development because we know that the brain is developing. So the child can grasp. You can't ask a first standard child uh, to do division three, you know, three digit division. The reason I know all this is because I teach my kids. So they came up to me and said, teach us maths. I said, Lord, I need your grace. <laughs> right? But you can't ask my grade one child to do what a fourth standard child is doing. Right? It takes time to get there. So the same way, there are stages of growth. When a church does not grow, it, is, it remains stagnant. That is a dangerous place. Now, when I talk about, when I say growth, not just numbers, I'm talking about in terms of spiritually um, raising up of leaders. That's what I'm talking about, right? Um, so a church that is stagnant will become a breeding ground for all kinds of wrong things. Because in the natural, stagnant water attracts what? Flies. And then it begins to smell. No fish can live in stagnant water. So there are several stages of growth and development that a church would normally go through. Now, I'm not saying all the churches go through this, right? but normally a church would go through this. Now, before I start, how many of you are, even those online, how many of you are planning to plant your own local church or establish your own Church, local church. One person, two, three. Okay, that's good. Okay, there's one person here, Biju. Okay, anyone else? You, 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 right? You, you plan to launch from scratch, right? I'm not talking about taking over your father's church or your own church, right? So this is going to really help you, out, right? This, this stage, this stages of growth, and try to. Uh, you know, just understand it and you can apply it as well. Okay, number one, pioneering stage. Now, in the pioneering stage, it is a stage where you have already thought about everything, right? Now, this is where you have gone back, right? You have done all the paperwork, right? You have finished everything, you've well, done the paperwork legally, you're entitled, and you have, you know, you have. The permission legally to start a church right you've done all the paperwork everything is done now what do you must what what is done normally a church planting team and leaders establish commitment to a territory where the lord sends them now if you are alone right try to get some like-minded people now the question may come who is those like-minded people if you don't have anyone it's all right the lord will bring somebody even if the Lord doesn't bring anybody, you, you try and have maybe one or two people in your team, initial stage. Now, this is the stage where you do the groundwork. So God has told you planted local church. For example, you say, OK, I am going to start a church in India, in my city. Example, right? Let's take Mumbai. I'm going to start in Mumbai. And then I'll start a church here. Now, the vision is all here. Right. I'll start a church in Mumbai. Then I'll plant many different churches. So I'll start off in central Mumbai. I'll, then I'll raise up leaders, go all across Mumbai. Then slowly, I will start going up north. Right? 
go up north, start planting churches, raise up leaders, start planting churches. And the vision is I should have churches all across India. Now you've laid the, that, that's your vision here. What is in your hand? Nothing. Right? But it's good to have that vision. Right? So then what you do is you do the, okay, in Mumbai, South Bangalore, which area should I choose? Nowadays, everything is so easy. Take your phone, go to Google. Okay, you choose a place, right? In Mumbai, okay, this is the place. Go. Number one, you can either choose to start in your own house, right? Or you can choose to take up a small space for rent and start off there. Again, this involves planning, right? Don't leave your job and say, God, give me rent money. No, right? Think, okay, if the rent is 10,000 a month, right, I have to save up for at least two years. I should not depend on anyone for two years. So two years rent, I'll save up, right? Now, this is just being practical, right? I'll save up. And then I know, okay, two years rent I have. Other things God will have a way, God will provide. But somewhere I have some base. Now, we don't have to go out and ask people, you know, please support me for speakers, support me for I need two guitars, I need one keyboard. Don't do all of that, right? You, you are going to start it. You'll prepare yourself, learn how to save, and do the basic needs, right? There'll come a time for us to ask when we want to build our own church, we, we need building fund that you can't do on your own. That is different. But initially, you do the basic things, right? save up. Don't be in a hurry to start something. And this is something that I've seen many, many young people do. Oh, God has called me to plant a church. They'll work for six months. No, I can't work. I put down my papers. I want to start the church. God is calling me. God is calling you. Now, when God is calling you, you must also be wise. Right? So you have all the paperwork done. You have the, it's a foundation laying stage, right? You are going down instead of going up, meaning what you do initially, what you start with is what you will have later on. The, the, you know, the, your, your life as a leader, what you show in the beginning will show, will, will determine what you'll be as a leader. For example, in the initial stage, you have a few people coming in. You've okay, you've started off in the house, for example, a house fellowship. You have house church, you have six people. Now, in the starting stage, if you're a person who's going on cracking unwanted jokes, acting foolish, talking about other pastors, talking about other ministries, what will happen? Nothing will happen. These five will be watching. So they know, okay, pastors like this. We can talk to him anything. He also talks about other churches. So what's happening? There's a people are getting to see what you are. Right? So this is the stage where you build a strong foundation. If this is the stage where you make sure that you have everything right. God, when it comes to doctrine, okay, this is the doctrine. So it'd be good to tell your church people. See, this is the doctrine. I believe in the Trinity. I believe that God the Father, He sent His Son. He died on the cross. You, you, you get your uh, doctrine right. So even if you go to APC, you go to the website, the doctrine is mentioned. This is what we believe in. Now, you may believe in a hundred different things, but this is what we believe in. So you can share it with the church. Two, financial accountability. So this is what we want to do as a church. From this Sunday, we'll make a note. And since you're only 10 people, you, your, your funds will be very less. So you have a diary. right? You, you choose one person from the team. You don't do it. Remember Paul? They all got the gifts uh, to give it to the church in Jerusalem. Paul said, I'm not taking it alone. I'll take two more people with me. He takes two more people with him and goes and gives it. He wanted to be accountable. So you write, you say, okay, financially, this is what we will do. All the money will go into the church account. 
So you're setting the foundation. So pre this will be the worship, 30 minutes worship, few announcements, then word, 30 minutes. And we'll have the Lord's table maybe two Sundays in a month. So what are you doing? You're laying the foundation. This is how church is going to be. Church will start at 9 a.m. Now at 9 a.m., if nobody comes, don't wait till 9.15. Nobody's come what to do. No, you start at 9 a.m. You get what I'm saying? Right? When I was in, uh, in Mangalore look, looking after the church there, now, not to put them down or not to uh, say anything against the Mangalore, they're very good people. But one problem was then they're, they're never on time. They're always late. But they're very well-meaning, very good believers. Right? But just the timing. So for me, it was very strange because 10 o'clock church starts. They would come at 10.15. I'm already leading worship. I'm seeing people come at 10.15. So after a few months, I realized that if I don't change this, because it was a foundation time for me in that church. There were only about 10 people in the church. I decided if I don't change this, this will become common. This will become the normalcy. So one, one Sunday, I just made up my mind. I said, I want to meet with all of you. So the entire church, 10 people, said, see, I understand that we all have commitments. We may have to get up, cook for our families, all of that. Church starts at 10 a.m. So whether you're there or not, I'm going to start at 10 a.m. It'll be good if you can somehow make it by 10 a.m. Now, very politely, okay, be very nice to them. Uh, don't say, you know, don't be judgmental. The way you pull it across is very important. So the way I, did, I said it. And over time, slowly, people began to understand. Whenever APC Mangalore has a meeting, whether people are there or not there, it will start on time. So a few months down the line, people knew. Worship evening, 6 p.m. Saturday evening, if people are not there, it will still start on time. Now, that became a culture. Over time, no, no, pastels are on time. So over time, everyone started coming early. Some of them came up to me and said, 10 o'clock you start. You want me to come earlier to help you with the chairs? And I said, yeah, if you can come, you come. Because I was doing it alone. Right? I used to set up the speakers, everything, set the guitar, everything, set the chairs, sweep, mop the place, set the chairs, keep everything ready, and then go lead worship. No worship leader. I did everything on my own. But then they realized, hey, how come it's clean here? Whole week it's not used. How come it's clean? How come it's... Who does it, Pastor? They ask. I said, I do it. I said, oh, you do it. Then he said, no, no, we'll come earlier. Now, what's happening here? You're setting a culture. So over time, they said, no, no, you don't do, Pastor. We will come and do. So two people will come. They'll help out. So suddenly, in the church in Mangalore, people started to change. Their thinking changed. Right? No, we should be on time. And then when it came to evangelism, there was zero evangelism in Mangalore. They didn't believe in evangelism. They, one was they were afraid because of all the things. Two is they didn't want to. But I remember I used to say, hey, why don't you come with me? And they would see me. Or, and then you know we would go as a team. And they would see. Then I said, oh, you go this area. Why to go together? I'll go to another area. And then over time, it became a habit. Every Friday evening, outreach. The culture has changed. So what you do laying, the laying of the foundation is very important. So then as we were growing as a church, you know, I remember we were about, uh, in, a, in a year, we became 60, 70 people odd. Uh, we grew very fast. And then we had these families. And then, you know, whenever people are discussing or there was any kind of gossip happening, our believer, our church members would just move away. And uh, some of them have come and told me, you know, something about your church, nobody talks unwanted things. And I was so happy to hear that. And then they asked, how come the church is there? Yeah, because our pastor doesn't talk much. So we also don't talk much. But we're a good community. So what you do as a leader will follow. Right? Set ground rules. That's your pioneering stage. You're setting the, a strong foundation. Right. Two is your administrative, organizational, and structure age. Now, as the church grows, now you're 10 people, then you grow 50, 
you start becoming 100 people now you know when you're about 100 people you can't do everything on your own right over time you will need volunteers right and these volunteers can be uh, paid staff or you can have like full time volunteers right now then you begin structure right so now you have the main pastor then you have if you feel that you need an associate pastor or an assistant pastor you hire somebody right so maybe you know for example as a senior pastor the church has become 100 people 100 150 people and you know many of them are calling you you know come to this place and preach come so sometimes you may take it sometimes you may not take it but also you should also have somebody who can take over in the sense you may not be keeping well you may know, you may have fever or something so somebody else should be able to preach no it's not like the no pastor no church doesn't work that way so you form a team either you have a paid assistant pastor or you raise up leaders and volunteers who can take up these positions so you have assistant pastor then you have volunteer teams right that is uh, the structural stage establish godly standards and in this stage you establish godly standards you provide guidelines for your ministry now remember the ministry is new people are new some of them may have experience coming from another church some of them may not have experience so you set certain guidelines now uh, people coming from other churches they may have to unlearn certain things they may say hey i did it like this in the previous church but that's not how you want to do it you are setting certain standards for your church so you say no we'll do it this way right um and then as the church grows you you know 100 500 5000 whatever as it grows you have more people you add structure to the team right so something in apc that we have is we have senior pastor we have associate pastors and then soon we may have assistant pastors right who will help the associate and the senior pastors then we have leaders volunteer leaders volunteer teams and we'll learn more about that right so there's a structure in place um but we are always open to people coming and speaking to us to any of us in the pastoral team now in this phase administrative phase new ministries can be birthed the lord can give a vision to either the senior leader or the associate pastors to start new ministries for example there can be an associate pastor who says hey you know what pastor i know somebody in the prison right uh, a, a, a police officer or somebody who does prison ministry can we as a church go into prison ministry and serve them once in two weeks yeah go ahead so now it could be a launch of a new ministry or somebody else may say hey, i i know of uh, a person from this college uh, he's a lecturer in this college can i ask him if we can come as a church and you know teach the the students or uh, do life skills for them i say yeah that can be launched into a new ministry that's why we have campus elevate then we have catalyst ministry which is for schools these are all planted over time right uh, and the lord may raise people with the gift and calling to do that work now i'll give you the best example i am somebody who can never do children's church ministry i tried it this i remember once i was rostered to uh, lead worship in the children's church i said okay i chose some three fast nice songs which children may like i went there and it was so difficult for me i i just could not i could not lead the worship properly there right because it was so different people you know kids right they're getting distracted they or they are you know talking amongst themselves or some of them of course are you know worshiping and all of that but it was not for me and i knew it was not for me but i've seen people especially you know people who have the gift of in children's ministry they know how to handle the kids one look is enough as <laughs> the child is or they just know how to handle the situation right so god will give us the gift to raise up these new ministries and he will send the people to do this right uh, so for example you may god may put in your heart to start prison ministry you may not have anybody to do the prison ministry but god will send a person he may send people he may send volunteers 
or he may raise up leaders within the church to look after that ministry. Now, not necessarily that I should have the gift, only then I can do it. I can grow in that gift. Right? For example, when I joined, I don't like visiting hospitals. Hospitals is not my thing. But when I joined APC, my one of my roles was member care. What I had to do? Go to hospitals. I had to go to ICUs. And we would go with the Bible. They'll say, okay, prayer, go in. Now, this is something, you know, when my parents, when my dad was admitted in the hospital, I never went in. I used to be outside with waiting. My mom would go in because I didn't like hospitals. So for me to get this role, I had to grow into it. You get what I'm saying, right? So it's not that because it's not something that I can do that I won't do. No, God may put us into an un uncomfortable spot. And he may ask us to get comfortable with it. Right? There's nothing wrong in that. So be open to uh, new ministries as well. Third stage is the pastoral team stage, the team ministry and senior pastor. Again, this is the stage when, uh, when the church is growing. You have 200 people, you want to plant a new location or you want to plant or you want, you need, you need other leaders. So you raise up the, you have like two or three associate pastors. It becomes a pastoral team. Then you have a team ministry. So you have, for example, a catalyst, uh, which goes into schools. So you have that school ministry. You need somebody who can lead that ministry. And then the pastor goes into the senior pastor stage. Right, the pastor who started with nothing, who started with five people, who did all the groundwork. Now he's seen the church grow. He goes into a senior pastor stage. As a senior pastor, he oversees the pastoral team. Now again, when you talk about overseas, he's not controlling. He's not saying you have to do this way. No, he works as a team. It's a it's a it's a stage that he is going through, but he he's come to the stage where he can give his input. He can, uh, you know, raise up new. When he's raising up new pastors, he's able to share his input. And over time, he would have learned so many things. He would have made mistakes, learned from those mistakes. Right? Even uh, me, uh, uh, when I got into this ministry, I, I made many mistakes. But you learn from it. You you have good days. You have bad days. Right? Sometimes you feel just tired and weary. Sometimes you feel, come on, let's do the work of the Lord. It happens that way. So you're just, uh, you know, you work together as a team. Uh, and in this senior pastor stage, you spend more time developing leaders, uh, helping them to understand the vision of the church that God has given, spend time nurturing new leaders. It's a time, it's a phase where you deliberately spend time with people. If I want to raise a leader, I cannot speak to him once a week over the phone. I need to be there, especially initially. I need to be there. Now, when it comes to leadership, we must understand some of them just take on that mantle of leadership very smoothly. We just know, OK, the gift is there. Just give them that one or two opportunities. They'll pick it up. But for others, you need to really be there. You need to really you know, develop them, help them. They may have a lot of questions, a lot of things that they have to learn and unlearn. You help them there, right? The more trust you give, the more faithful your leaders will be. What a powerful sentence this is. The more I trust you, the more faithful your leader will be. So as a pioneer, as a leader, you may go into this place of senior pastor or you know, the main pastor of the church. And you may have staff under you. Do not control them. Yes, you oversee them. You make sure that they're bearing fruit, all of that. But learn to trust them. Learn to trust. Here's the, you know, one of the most beautiful things that I have witnessed here. As a leader, I've been given a lot of freedom to do what I want to do in the ministries that I serve in whether it's life group ministry, men's ministry, APC East, I have a lot of freedom, right? There's a, there's a lot of trust placed on the leaders. And what happens is it gives us the freedom to do ministry freely. But 
we also sit with the senior pastor and we discuss okay we have yearly reviews right so last year this is you know so many life groups how are the life groups how are they growing are they uh, are there new leaders being raised up so we review ourselves right it's not like i trust and don't do anything about it i i need to make sure that there is some kind of growth happening right uh, the more faithful your leaders are when we put trust in them trust their work give them time to learn give them time to learn from their mistakes give them time to grow right and when you see them grow that is the greatest joy that we can uh, you know that we can uh, witness in our lives right daniel asks a question here when a church reaches the pastoral team stage will the responsibility of the pastor be same what was in the pioneering stage yeah so the the responsibility will not be the same it will be more actually see the pioneering stage is you just got maybe 5 or 10 people you've done the groundwork you you you're set the foundation and you know you're doing the work of the ministry but as the church grows the responsibility grows even more i can't say i have 100 people and i'm i'm the senior pastor how many leaders one leader no so the more people i have with me the more the responsibility right so the more i have to do work with less people it's lesser with more people it's more so sometimes we think it's the opposite oh the church has grown so less work no the church has grown so there's more ministry to be done there's more responsibility there's more work to be done right so then we get into the equipping stage and the building stage and the trainer stage now the time is up oh, okay so we'll stop here we'll get into this uh from the equipping stage from next class onwards right let's just quickly close with a word of prayer right? father we thank you for teaching us about the local church and all that we have learned to god i pray that you will minister and continue to speak in and through us lord thank you for this time in jesus name we pray amen amen all right thank you everyone see you next hour god bless